probably everybody here knows about the recent district court case in Pennsylvania, Kitzmiller versus Dover. School board members, upset over a standard biology textbook being, quote, laced with evolution, promoted the, pur the purchase of an alternative to evolution, the intelligent design textbook of pandas and people. After many months of wrangling with community members, the school board passed a policy requiring the teaching of intelligent design. Shortly thereafter, a group of parents sued the district, and probably everybody here is aware that in December, Judge John Jones III ruled decisively that intelligent design did not qualify as science and that promoting it in the public schools was unconstitutional. I want to talk tonight about intelligent design, but in order to understand intelligent design, you really need to know something about creationism in general in the United States because, as I will try to demonstrate, intelligent design is a descendant with modification of an earlier form of creationism called creation science. Basically, there are two kinds of anti-evolutionism in the United States today, the Bible-based or creation science variety, the second kind of creationism, anti-evolutionism, that we find in the United States today is the intelligent design variety, which I will spend most of my time on. But I want you to think about the content of intelligent design. In content, intelligent design is merely a subset of creation science. In other words, everything that you read or hear or encounter in intelligent design creationism is found in creation science. There are some things in creation science that are ignored or just uh, not mentioned, downplayed in intelligent design creationism, but everything in intelligent design does come from the earlier form of creationism. So let's just take a couple minutes to talk about that. Creation science, as it's often called, is a position presented originally, uh, at least in the 20th century, by Henry Morris who truly is the most important creationist of the 20th century, much more important than William Jennings Bryan or just about anybody else you can think of. He developed the idea of scientific creationism, which is the claim that you can take the biblical literalist view of, of creation, which is God having created everything all at one time in its present form, and support it with science. That's why he called it scientific creationism. And the most prestigious creation science organization is the Institute for Creation Research, although it's not the only one. There actually are quite a few, and uh, Answers in Genesis in Florence, Kentucky is as large as, or perhaps even by now a little larger than Answers in Genesis. The essence of young earth creationism, as it's often called, is the Christian doctrine of special creationism. Now, Special creationism is the view that certainly God created, all Christians believe God created, but it's the way God created. And special creationist theology says that God created everything in its present form. So when you see a pine tree or a barnacle or a, a, um, a bear or a human being, God created each of these kinds of organisms in their present form. And the kinds of organisms have limited genetic variability. So there's no possibility of one kind of organism giving rise to another kind of organism. You can have evolution within the kind, but because of the limited genetic variability within a created kind, you can never properly have what we as evolutionary biologists would call evolution. You can never have the common ancestry of, of living things and a branching tree of life. The difference between creation and evolution is that evolution views the history of life as a tree, as this branching genealogy of species. Creationism views species as a lawn, where each blade of grass is a separate creation. And that's, that's kind of a nice metaphor, I think, to keep in mind. Um, the science of, uh, oh, I forgot to mention. Um, there's another kind of special creationism um, which is something called progressive creationism. The most common form of special creationism, God creates all of these kinds of organisms at one time about 10,000 years ago. That's why it's called young earth creationism. There's also something called progressive creationism where God creates things in their present form but creates them sequentially through time. And this is the kind of special creationism you find in intelligent design. In intelligent design, God intervenes to create 
uh, things in their present form, although they tend to be biochemical or molecular things rather than whole organisms, although that's in there too if you read carefully. Uh, God would create something like the bacteria flagellum, which is the picture that you see up there. But God created that as an entity. Bacteria flagella did not evolve. Bacteria flagella were created in their present form as we see them. So it is a special creation kind of model. But God just does this sequentially through time rather than all at once. So first God creates DNA, and then God creates the first replicating cell, and then God creates the bacteria flagellum, and then a billion years later he creates, um, I guess, the eukaryotic flagellum, because that's different from, but anyway, you get the picture. Then he creates the Cambrian explosion, all those invertebrate body plants. God is a serial creator rather than an all at once creator. In, in intelligent design, but it's still the doctrine of special creation. And I think that's important. I'd like you to keep that in mind. The science of young earth creationism is pretty awful uh, in just about any field, whether it's astronomy, geology, biology, anthropology. Uh, the claims that they make are just simply wrong, uh, and there's really no coherency to them whatsoever. I don't want to spend a long time on young earth creationism, but I do want to point out a couple of things about creation science that are carried forth into intelligent design. And one of them is a dichotomous view of the universe. Uh, to the young earth creationist, there's only two alternatives out there. There's either special creation or there's evolution. So the logic that they firmly believe, I mean, this is, you know, it, it's a strategy, yes, but it's also something that they are really quite committed to. The logic that they firmly believe is that all you have to do is disprove evolution. And what's left? Well, of course, what's left is special creation. So disproving evolution proves creationism. You don't need to have positive evidence for special creationism. You just need to eliminate the alternative. A little bit later on, uh, when I describe intelligent design, this will sound kind of familiar, because this, this is a very similar approach that you find in um, in intelligent design as well. The logic of this is quite flawed. Number one, there are not only two alternatives. It's not that your choices are either special creation or evolution. You have a lot of possibilities. The most uh, prominent that comes to mind is something called theistic evolution, which is the theology of Catholics and most mainstream Protestants. The idea that, well, of course, evolution occurred but it was the way God chose to bring uh, living things and the rest of the universe into existence. Now, if you disprove evolution, you don't disprove theistic evolution. Obviously, uh, the, the, this is a false kind of dichotomy because there are many possible uh, alternative explanations over here on the creationism side. So it is simply not true that God creating everything in, at one time in its present uh, form or God creating serially through time in its present form is proven if you disprove evolution. It simply is faulty logic. When they're arguing against evolution, creation science proponents list a very, um, uh, 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 the, the same kinds of arguments that the intelligent design creationists list. Um, and these are, for example, that there are gaps in the fossil record. Because there are gaps in the fossil re record, this disproves evolution, therefore creationism happened. Because natural selection and random genetic variation is insufficient to explain complex things, therefore evolution didn't take place, and therefore creation science wins. You know, this, this dichotomous, if you're wrong, I'm right. If evolution is wrong, creationism is right kind of argument. There's a lot of, of um, misunderstanding about evolution, about science, really, in the creation science literature. One of the most pervasive being the equation of natural forces with chance and randomness. Uh, nature is chance, it's, it's chaotic, it's random. Design, God, is directed, organized, squared away. When you see the really quite complicated things that you often do see in biological organisms, many Americans just sort of naturally say, oh, well, of course, there's no way to explain that by random chance processes. And every evolutionary biologist would agree with you that something like a bacteria flagellum could not possibly have been assembled by random amino acids or proteins falling together to form this functioning structure. Everyone would agree with that. The error lies much deeper. The error lies in equating any natural process with chance. And of course, Charles Darwin's great discovery was that the process of natural selection is a natural process 
that generates complex structures. It is a natural process, but it is not a chance process. Don't ever let anybody ever tell you natural selection is a chance process. It isn't. It's adaptive differential reproduction, and you can ask your biology professor what that means, because I don't have time to talk about everything. One of the common threads that you find in uh, creation science is that there's some sort of systematic difference between macroevolution, by which they mean common ancestry, and microevolution, by which they mean natural selection and these other mechanisms that work at the species or kind level, uh, created kind if you're a creationist. And a very common position in creation science and evidence against evolution is the idea that the Earth is simply too young for evolution to have occurred. That last is something that's left out of intelligent design, but I'll get to there in a moment. Now, creation science was and remains an active political and social movement, but it remains fundamentally a religious position wrapped up in science. During the 1970s and 80s, there were many efforts made to get creation science taught in local school districts, and also to try to get laws passed in states requiring the teaching of creation science if evolution were taught. In Arkansas, Arkansas Law 590 was passed in 1981, which required that if evolution were taught, it had to be balanced by the teaching of creation science. The Arkansas Bill 590 was challenged immediately by a group of plaintiffs. And the plaintiffs in uh, the McLean versus Arkansas case, to many people's surprise, were the religious leaders of a large number of Protestant and of Christian um, uh, denominations. These included the Presbyterians. Uh, Bill McLean, the, the lead plaintiff, was a Presbyterian minister. The United Methodists, the Episcopals, the Catholic, the African Methodist Episcopal, and the Southern Baptists. They've changed since. Um, but all these religious organizations were against the teaching of creation science. And that made a lot of people scratch their heads until they realized that creation science was promoting a very specific religious view. It was not, presenting, pre, uh, it was not promoting the idea that, well, God had something to do with it. It was promoting the very specific special creationist view of biblical literalism. And all these denominations were not literalist in their theology, and so they did not want the schools teaching a theology that they didn't agree with Monday through Friday and then have to straighten the kids out on Saturday and Sunday. So the key plaintiffs in McLean versus Arkansas were religious leaders, and they were joined by parents and educators as well. McLean was a fascinating experience. It was a full trial. The, um, a, a very distinguished group of evolutionary biologists and geologists and physicists, uh, chemists I mean, um, presented uh, very good evidence for why creation science did not meet the uh, tenets of science and why the fact claims that creation science made, such as the world being 10,000 years old and such as the Grand Canyon being cut by Noah's flood and things like that, were just rubbish as far as science was concerned. Whatever your religious beliefs, creation science was not science. On the other side were a series of um, not nearly as well-known scientists, in fact, scientists that most people had never heard of at all, and uh, under the very skilled questioning of the, um, of the plaintiff's attorneys, the um, defense, which was the pro-creationist side, um, was forced to admit some very embarrassing things uh, on the witness stand because they had been admitted them under deposition, such as that UFOs are the works of Satan. I mean. That's the kind of thing that kind of gets to your credibility and does not impress a judge a whole lot. Well, the defense utterly failed to convince the judge that creation science was scientific, and Judge John Overton ruled that the law in Arkansas was unconstitutional. Creation science was not science, and teaching it in the public schools violated the First Amendment. The full trial of McLean versus Arkansas, in which the creationists had their, their opportunity to present the best argument they had for why creation science was science. The uh, plaintiffs had the best opportunity to present reasons why they thought it was not science. It turned out to be such a crushing defeat for the creationists that the state didn't even appeal. 
So this case remained at the district court level. Some of you are thinking about, gee, this sounds a whole lot like Kitzmiller versus Dover, if you've been following the recent intelligent design trial. And indeed, uh, as this trial was going on and as we were preparing for it for, for the uh, practically a full year, you know, McLean and Kitzmiller parallels just kept coming to mind. And of course, the fact that Kitzmiller was not appealed either is, is sort of one of the sad outcomes of, of that case. But I would urge you to read the decision in McLean. It was published in Science Magazine, and it's available online in many places, including our website, because it's a very, very wonderful history of the creation and evolution controversy and how creation science grows out of a fundamentally, no pun intended, religious position and is really just masquerading as science. Well, first there was the Arkansas Equal Time Law, which was uh, so well defeated, thoroughly defeated, but hot on its heels was a law passed in Louisiana, another equal time law, in fact, almost identical in wording to the Arkansas law. Science teacher Don Aguilard brought suit um, against the um, state of Louisiana. And this is the, this, there was not a full trial in this case. It was just done on summary judgments. But this is the case that got all the way to the Supreme Court. And in Edwards versus Aguilar, the Supreme Court judged that creation science was not science, leaning heavily on McLean. It was not science. It was unconstitutional to advocate it in the public schools. Um, now let's shift to where intelligent design comes in. McLean, excuse me, Edwards versus Arkansas was decided in 1987, but it basically took a long time to work its way through the courts. Mc, uh, Edwards started about in the early 1980s, which is the time that McLean was being decided. Also in the early 1980s, this man, John Buell, from a Christian ministry in Dallas called the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, was concerned, as were a number of other conservative Christians, that creation science wasn't making it. Uh, the McLean decision had been so very powerful, it looked like creation science was not likely to survive, although they, they kept their hopes up. But they began discussing an alternative to creation science that would maybe not make some of the same mistakes, like making fact claims about the age of the Earth, which could be refuted by science, making fact claims about the effect of Noah's flood, which could be refuted through geological science. And so they were trying to come up with a form of creationism that would pass Signed, uh, passed legal muster. Um, creation science wasn't getting very far with the courts, but it also wasn't getting very far with mainstream Christians. The biblical literalism, the young earth part, just seemed a little bit wacky to most Christians uh, who were perfectly happy with an ancient earth, and most of them were reasonably happy with uh, theistic evolution. So part of the goal of this group of conservative Christians who uh, gathered around John Buell in the early 1980s was to try to come up with something that would be more appealing to Christians across the board and would also withstand legal scrutiny. The movement that they began um, became Intelligent Design. But the first book that Thaxton's group produced was this book, The Mystery of Life's Origin. Now this is a book on the origin of life. But it, and it was published in 1984, and it is the first statement of what became intelligent design theory, although it did not use the phrase intelligent design. It did talk about intelligent agents and used a lot of the same language, but it was not billing itself as, this is a new theory called intelligent design theory. All the ideas are there, though. This is a book on the origin of life and why the origin of life is impossible to explain through natural cause. In the foreword to this book, Dean Kenyon wrote, it's fundamentally implausible that unassisted matter and energy organize themselves into living systems. Fundamentally implausible. The assumption here is that certain things in nature that are of such complexity and difficulty to explain just should be taken off the table and you don't even try to explain them through natural cause. Scientists have been trying to explain the origin of life for decades, and they haven't succeeded. It's time to admit that this is an unsolvable problem and just attribute it to the intelligent agent, who is, of course, God. Uh, but you can't say God, because then you can't get taught in the public schools. So we'll just say it's an intelligent agent. Okay. 
and I don't think anybody really is fooled. This continues to be a theme in modern intelligent design because this is basically the idea of intelligent design, that there are certain things that are simply incapable of explanation, so therefore God did it. The operant idea here is structural complexity, really complex things like the origin of life or the bacteria flagellum or the blood clotting cascade or some of these other examples that they use are just categorically unexplainable. We've heard this before. This was the position taken by William Paley in 1802 in his book Natural Theology, where Paley wrote that if you see a watch on the heath, uh, you know because of the complexity of that watch, all of these pieces, uh, all of these springs and wires and so forth that fit together, allow you to tell time, you know that those springs and wires could not have come spontaneously together to make a functional watch. You know if you see a watch on the heath that there had to have been a watchmaker. If you see a rock, the rock could have been there forever, whatever. If you see a watch, you know by its structural complexity there had to be a watchmaker. So, reasoned Paley, if you see a complex biological structure like the vertebrate eye, you know because of the complexity that all of these parts, these lenses and, and um, uh, uh, liquids and, and uh, membranes and um, uh, vessels and nerves, all of these things that fit together, you know this could not have been a result of chance. So therefore there had to have been a god. Interestingly enough, his book Natural Theology was apologetics, was a, um, an argument for the existence of God. It was a way of converting people to, to Christianity. Uh, it, was, uh, it took the 1800s by storm. Uh, this was thought to be a really, really great idea, and it, it brought nature together with God and made everybody very happy. Of course, this is where Charles Darwin comes in and why um, On the Origin of Species was such a controversial book. It wasn't because Darwin um, s supported very, very strongly the idea that living things had common ancestors, because that idea was floating around and that wasn't terribly upsetting. Darwin just kind of nailed that coffin shut because his book was so good at, at marshalling all this circumstantial evidence that the only reasonable conclusion from all of these kinds of data is that living things shared common ancestors rather than having been created separately. It was his mechanism of natural selection, which as I mentioned before, was a natural mechanism that resulted in design. And in fact, knowing that his contemporaries were very familiar with Paley's watch and the eye as examples of, of special creation, of design, Darwin specifically used the eye as an example in On the Origin of Species, as an example of how natural selection can produce complex structures. A natural process can produce complexity. It's not a matter of these pieces falling together randomly by chance. And that was a huge, huge revelation. Well, I want to talk about the second of Buell's book. The first book, um, Mystery of Life's Origin, uh, did present um, the basic idea of intelligent design. But his second book um, started floating around in the, uh, or references to it started floating around in 1981. Uh, you notice the um, headline there about uh, lawsuit prospects dim in Arkansas, bright in Louisiana. This is from the Students for Origins Research, sorry, Students for Origins Research newsletter, a young earth creationist group, 1981. But I want to call your attention to this news article right here. Unbiased biology textbook plan. A high school biology textbook is in the planning stages that will be sensitively written to present both evolution and creation while limiting discussion to scientific data. Hmm, that's very interesting. This book became of pandas and people. Now, this was the first book to use the phrase intelligent design in the modern sense in reference to this movement that we recognize as being based in this earlier uh, movement. And, um, and, and that's kind of interesting when you think about it. Um, most scientific theories um, follow kind of a standard trajectory. 
Uh, you get the idea, you go out and test it, you build your theory, you get other people doing research, you write papers, you uh, test ideas some more, you throw out the things that don't work, you gradually build an explanation, you gradually build your theoretical perspective, and you convince your colleagues that this is a better mousetrap, so to speak, you convince your colleagues that your theory is really good, and then everybody starts testing it and using it, and pretty soon everybody says, we knew it all along, um, this is a really good explanation. <laughs> And then you write a textbook. The intelligent design people did it all backwards. They wrote the textbook first before they did any of the research. Now that is a curious approach. And I think does help to illustrate the, my point that I would like to make, that intelligent design really is a social and political movement rather than a true scientific movement. The first thing these guys did, virtually, was write a textbook so they could get their ideas into the high school curriculum. They didn't go out and try to convince scientists that intelligent design was a legitimate scientific field and go out and test its ramifications. No, no, they wrote the textbook first. It's an interesting approach. Well, the science in, of pandas and people is just awful. Uh, it repeats most of the same creation science arguments. There are gaps in the fossil record. Uh, natural selection can't produce complicated things. Uh, homology is a bogus concept, and so forth. I want to just give you a quick little example of why the science of, of uh, pandas and people is so terrible. And I want to use their example of molecular homology. They have this picture in Pandas and People, and don't worry about reading the fine print, because I will tell you what the text says. You see a bullfrog, a turtle, a chicken, a rabbit, and a horse there on the right-hand side, and then all those little lines go back to carp, fish. Um, this is a, um, a map of genetic distances of cytochrome C, which is a very stable molecule. And you see that uh, bullfrog, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and horse all have about the same molecular distance from carp, 13, 13, 14, 13, 13. They're all about the same distance. Now here's what the text says. Amphibians, represented in the chart by the bullfrog, are traditionally considered closer to fish in the evolutionary scale. Yet on a molecular level, they are no closer to fish than to reptiles or to mammals. To use the classic Darwinian scenario, amphibians are intermediate between fish and other land-dwelling vertebrates. Analysis of their amino acids should place amphibians in an approximately intermediate position, but it does not. Is there an evolutionary biologist in the house? No. Are you clenching your teeth? <laughs> Don't do that. It's bad for your gums. Okay. Well, what they have in mind, of course, is the great chain of being. Okay? The worm mounting through the spires of form, striving to be man. Right? Isn't that a cute rabbit? I mean, <laughs> that's the cutest rabbit I've ever seen. Anyway, so, but th there's this idea that there's this great chain of being, the scala nature, the, the um, uh, uh, ladder of life from the simplest to the most complex. And of course, guess who's on top, naturally? That goes without <laughs> saying. Um, that's my governor that you're speaking of. Um, but it's not my fault. <laughs> OK, this is all wrong, OK? Their claim about what evolutionists expect, uh, they claim evolutionary biologists expect the, the molecular evidence to show that amphibians are closer to fish than they are to the tetrapods, wrong. This is the real story, OK? Do you see where the tuna is? That's fish. OK, do you see where this arrow is? That is the common ancestral point of all the land vertebrates, right? All the tetrapods, all the land vertebrates branched off from the general chordate line there. Notice fish branched off earlier. What this means is the molecular evidence show exactly what we, we real evolutionary biologists, say it should show. It shows that fish are equally distant from all the land vertebrates, because that's exactly what we expect. No, I'm sorry, that, I was put the wrong way. This is what the data show, and it's not because we expect it, it's because that's what the data show, OK? <laughs> Didn't want to leave anybody with the wrong impression here. But you know, pandas and people just completely misstates the evolutionary biology position. 
Um, where, and, and it's the sort of thing that does make evolutionary biologists tear their hair. Um, there, is no ex there is no expectation in evolutionary biology for amphibians to be more closely related to fish than to the other tetrapods. We are all, all of us land vertebrates are equally related to fish. Now, the pandas and people um, book is dead wrong in a lot of ways, but it's exactly the same, it's, it's wrong in exactly the same way as the creation science claims are wrong. And in fact, it repeats a lot of the creation science um, positions in its book. In the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial that concluded a month or so ago, um, Pandas and People was one of the books, as I mentioned, uh, that the school board wanted the students to uh, be taught. Um, eventually, they had to back down and said, well, we'll just put them in the library and the students can use them for research. They bought 60 copies. That's kind of more than you really need in the library, right? The intent was for these books to be used in the classroom, but they had to back down. Very interesting thing happened in NCSE's uh, archives. We had a number of letters uh, to supporters of the Foundation for Thought and Ethics dating back to the mid to early 70, uh, 80s, where they were um, sending out letters kind of like that um, Students for Origins research article, you know, help support us. We're trying to get this new creation biology book adopted. Send us your money so we can market this. And we're trying to get it written, trying to get a, a secular publisher, not a religious publisher, because we want to sell this in the public schools. We thought, yeah, and, and they would mention the titles of some of these books, like Creation Biology and Biology and Origins. We thought, boy, this sounds like this could be the predecessor to pandas and people. These are the paleo pandas, so to speak. So we mentioned this to the lawyers, and the lawyer said, that's really interesting. Let's subpoena a foundation for thought and ethics and see if those old manuscripts are around. And of course, FTE just about died when that happened. And they immediately tried to get an injunction to you know, keep the um, subpoena from going through. But the judge said, nope, you got to cough up those manuscripts. And they did. So what we ended up with is a series of manuscripts called Creation Biology, Biology and Creation, Biology and Origins. And then the name of these manuscripts shifted to Pandas and People. And we had a couple of versions of Pandas and People. And then the first publication of Pandas and People was 1989. And the second edition was in 1993. That's the x-axis there. You all see that? Because this is fun. <laughs> this is fun. When we got those manuscripts, we scanned them, did some word searches on them. And we found a very interesting pattern. We searched for the word creationism, creationist. We searched for the phrase intelligent design. And we saw, found a most fascinating pattern through time. The red line <laughs> is the number of times that the phrase creationism occurred. And the blue line is the number of times that the phrase intelligent design occurred. And they cross in 1987, which those of you who were paying attention earlier in the lecture will remember is the date of Edwards versus Aguillard striking down creation science. There's other evidence um, tying intelligent design to creation science as well, uh, which we were able to uh, dig out of these old manuscripts, much to the delight of the legal staff. Um, in the um, Biology and Creation 1986, there's this definition of creation. Creation means the various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings. That is special creation, right? Creation of things in their present form. Fish with uh, fins and scales, birds with feathers. This is Biology and Creation 1986. Same thing happens in Biology and Origins 1987. I won't read each of these, of course. But this is, the, this, this is the transitional fossil, so to speak. Um, um, excuse me, let me make sure about this. Yes. Um, the title of this book is of pandas and people, but it still has this old wording in it. It still has the wording that creation means that various forms, fish with fins and scales, bird with feathers. In the next issue of pandas and people, they change the word creation to intelligent design. But it's the same fish with fins and scales, birds with beaks, feathers, and wings, et cetera. Now, lest you think this was an oversight, the second edition of Pandas and People, 1993, has the very same phrase. What's even more wonderful is that um, William Dembski, who is a uh, key intelligent designs uh, uh, theorist, 
I'll talk about him a little bit later. William Dembski was originally a witness for the uh, defense. He was a witness in support of intelligent design. He was a witness for the school board. And he submitted a witness statement which listed his, um, his uh, opinions about the matter of the trial. All of the witnesses submitted witness statements. You can read these on our website. They're really interesting. And in his witness sta statement, he mentioned um, with some pride that he was the editor of the third edition of Pandas and People, which was going to be called The Design of Life. So the lawyer said, okie doke, let's subpoena it. Um, and at that point, um, uh, Bill um, withdrew from the case and, and uh, ceased to be a witness anymore, but we did get the design of life. And in the design of life, in the chapter on fossils, we find, are you ready? <laughs> Sudden emergence holds that various forms of life began with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, etc. <laughs> when this was presented in the Kitzmiller trial, uh, Eric Rothschild, who will be speaking on campus on the 9th, I was told. Uh, he's the, the key attorney for Pepper Hamilton, who was the, um, the commercial litigation firm that, that funded this whole project. Uh, it really, uh, go hear him. He's, he's really great. Go hear these guys. They're wonderful. But when he was cross-examining Michael Behe, who is another prominent intelligent design spokesperson, he, um, he presented, he showed a slide very similar to this. Mine's prettier. <laughs> Um, he showed a sli slide showing how you know, fish with fins and scales shows up in the design of life, which is sort of son of pan pandas and people. And he asked um, uh, Behe, if, uh, does this mean that uh, um, in another couple of years we'll be having the sudden emergence trial? And the judge says, not on my docket. <laughs> <laughs> the judge was cool. Okay, let's talk about intelligent design. This is kind of a long warm up, but the background was, was fun to hear. Um, now, I grew up in the Upper Midwest. I believe in the Thumper Principle. If you can't some say something nice, don't say nothing at all, right? So I'm going to say something nice about intelligent design. I'm not going to say a whole lot of things that are nice about intelligent design, but I will say something nice about intelligent design, and I'm serious about this. Because I think the whole intelligent design controversy is very important for a couple of reasons. It reminds us of the importance of keeping the door of science open to theists. I'll talk a little bit later on about the cultural renewal part of intelligent design and the motivation for this anti-evolution position. Largely is the idea that science means God had nothing to do with it. And the intelligent design people believe that evolution is a totally materialist, phenomenon, God can have nothing to do with it, and when a high school teacher teaches evolution, the high school teacher is telling the students to take their God and shove it. It's not happening. But I think we need to be reminded that we should be sure that when we teach evolution, whether at the college level or the high school level, that we be sure to not present it in a way that limits the ability of a student who is religious to accommodate his or her religious views to the science we are presenting. This actually involves a very important principle uh, called materialism, which is very confusing because we use it in two ways in science and philosophy. One way that we use the term materialism is in science. We talk of something called methodological materialism. Now, materialism is the idea that matter and energy uh, are used to explain the natural world. And in science, this is a methodology. We restrict ourselves to natural cause. Science is a limited way of knowing, I like to tell people. We are limited to explaining just the natural world. We're not telling you how to treat each other, morals and ethics. We're just trying to explain the natural world. And we limit ourselves to natural cause. The reason we limit ourselves to natural cause, to methodological naturalism, is not because all scientists are atheists, because they aren't. The reason we limit ourselves to natural cause is because the essence of science is testing ideas against the natural world. Just because an idea sounds good doesn't mean you accept it. You have to test it. An essential part of testing, as you learned in seventh grade, is to hold constant certain variables so that you can see the effect of changes and see whether your explanation really is the one that, that, that explains the phenomenon you're trying to, to dis, uh, explain. 
you have to hold constant. We call that control. It's don't like that term, but holding constant certain variables is very important in being able to test a theory, test a hypothesis. If there is an omnipotent force in the universe, you cannot hold its actions constant. God, please don't act on these two cornfields. I want to make sure that it's the fertilizer that makes it grow. You can't put God in a test tube, right? You cannot test explanations involving supernatural cause, involving an omnipotent cause, because any outcome you get is compatible with the actions of that omnipotent cause. That's what omnipotence is all about. It's very useful. But because of that, because we can't test statements about God's actions, we just leave them out of science. But as my friend Robert Pinnock said, another Michigan um, scholar, to say nothing of God is not to say that God is nothing. When we talk about cell division in biology, we don't say, you know, here are the enzymes that cause the chromosomes to line up in the midline, and God had nothing to do with it. And here are the enzymes that form the spindle fibers, and God had nothing to do with it. And here are the enzymes that make the cell break apart, and God had nothing to do with it. Of course not. When we talk about evolution, we talk about the phylogenies. We talk about the tree of life. We talk about how bears and dogs had a common ancestor in the Miocene. We're not saying, and God had nothing to do with it, because we don't talk about God acting or not acting when we're wearing our scientist hat. If as a religious individual you want to believe that God wanted bears and dogs to emerge out of a common ancestor, there's nothing in science that's going to say you can't say that. But there's nothing in science that you can use to test that either. And it's not a scientific idea because it's not testable. Okay? That's methodological materialism or methodological naturalism. There's also something called philosophical materialism. This is a philosophical view, not a scientific view, that says matter and energy is it, folks. There is no God. There are no ancestor spirits. There's no uh, supernatural whatsoever. Matter, energy, and their interactions is all that the universe is composed of. This is a philosophical view. It's held by a lot of people, but it is not a view that is compelled by science. Okay? I happen to hold that view, but I can't say that science proves that point of view. I have to say I hold that view because of my own particular background and what I think about reality. But a theist can, use, can look at the same empirical evidence that I look at, and given his particular philosophical view, see the hand of God and so forth, I don't. Science is an equal opportunity substratum for philosophy, okay? It does not compel either theism or disbelief or, or philosophical materialism. But there are a lot of scientists around who kind of get this mixed up. And the creationists love to quote these folks, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, um, uh, Dennett, uh, William Provine. Uh, I'll give you an example from a Scientific American article by a friend of mine, uh, Michael Shermer, who wrote, he was talking about the Gallup poll, a paltry 12% accept the standard scientific theory that human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God had no part in this process. Excuse me? When did that become part of the standard scientific theory? The standard thi scientific theory is that evolution happened, that living things shared common ancestors. The standard scientific theory is that living things descended with modification from common ancestors. Full stop, period. If you believe God guided the process, that's fine. That's a theological belief. If you believe God had nothing to do with the process, that's fine. That's a philosophical belief. Neither are compelled by the scientific data. Michael is simply wrong when he says this. And the other scientists who make similar statements simply have not thought this through. Um, so let's get to intelligent design. I know you've been waiting. Actually, I have been talking about it all along, but that's OK. Intelligent design basically <clears throat> has two points that it makes. It makes some scientific and philosophical points. And it claims under this rubric that it can detect the evidence for design. It claims that using two methods, you can distinguish those things in nature that are a result of natural cause from those things in nature that cannot be explained through natural cause. One of these is irreducible complexity, and the other is something called the design inference. 
The second component of intelligent design is what they call cultural renewal. I'll try to talk briefly about both of these. Let's talk about the design inference, William Dembski's idea that he presented in his book, The Design Inference. Now, this is an a algorithm that he presented in his book, and it's pretty impossible to read, but it's basically a flow chart. You're trying to explain something, like who won the lottery, um, why does that big white um, circle in the sky change shape every month? You know, you're, you're, there are a lot of things we might want to explain, phases of the moon, whatever. Um, and so the first thing you look at it is at high probability. Is this something that happens all the time? Well, the phases of the moon change very regularly, so we would not ascribe the phases of the moon to anything other than natural cause. That's fine. It's a high probability thing, um, so that's fine. Is it intermediate probability? Well, a lot of intermediate probability things can be attributed to chance. Um, and so unless it's a really low probability uh, uh, event that you're trying to explain, like winning a lottery in, in uh, you know, one in 10 million or something, um, then um, in general you would attribute it to chance. Um, but uh, low probability things, which is his bottom triangle there, or diamond, need to be considered very carefully because here is where you might be able to make a design inference. A low probability um, event, like let's say we walked into um, this room and there were 10 bulls bullseyes, um, well actually this is pretty, okay, we go outside and there's a barn and there are 10 bullseyes on the barn and there are 10 arrows in the middle of, the, uh, of, of each bullseye. We would probably say, wow, that is one heck of an archer. We would know that this is not just random. We would know that, you, you know, t arrows don't show up in bullseyes just by chance. We would attribute this to design or the skill of the archer. And if we saw 10 of them in a row, we'd be pretty impressive, impressed. Now that's a low probability event we might attribute design to. But we'd need a little bit of extra information. And this is what Dembski refers to as specification. Specification is like a little side information. In, in, the term, in terms of the 10 bullseyes, we would want to know that the bullseyes were painted first and then the arrow was shot, <laughs> right? Okay. If we have that little side information, then we can make uh, an inference of design. So we would fall into the bottom pocket. Let's see how this works um, in a uh, little bit more schematic. You have an event you're trying to explain. If it's high probability, you attribute it to natural cause. If it's intermediate or unspecified low probability, you attribute it to chance. If it's specified low probability, ta-da, it's design. That's the design inference. Now the problem here, there's a lot of problems here and we don't have time to go through them all, but I want to go through one that I think everybody can understand even if you don't understand anything about probability theory. And that is I want you to take a close look at that first step where you're attributing something to natural cause. Um, okay, don't worry, I'm not gonna call on you. Everybody here who's a scientist, raise your hand. Ra or, or a grad student, we'll give you credit. Keep your hand up, <laughs> keep your hand up. No, keep your hand up, this is, this is, I won't call on you. It's a, you can put your hand up again. <laughs> keep your hand up, this is, this is, I won't call on you, you're, you'll be perfectly innocent. Okay, a lot of hands up, right? Okay, now, keep your hand up. I want you to keep your hand up if you think we have answered all the questions in science. <laughs> That's the problem with this first step. It's based upon what we know about natural cause, but it doesn't take into account what we still have yet to discover. Let's pretend that we are European peasants in the year 800. And we are walking along the bank and we see something like this. What's this? Fairy rings. Fairy rings, yeah. Whoa, this is pretty cool. Well, we wouldn't say that if we were peasants of the year 800, but <laughs> whatever the you know, year 800 equivalent of far out would be, we, we would say that. <laughs> this is really, this is really you know, crazy. I mean, look at these this circle of toadstools that just sprung up overnight. It wasn't here yesterday. So we're gonna try to explain fairy rings, okay? Is it high probability? Certainly not, it wasn't there yesterday. This just went poof. And it wasn't, won't be there next week because it'll, you know, they, they break down pretty quickly and who knows when it's gonna come again. I mean, this is, this is not a high probability event. So it's not high probability. It's, is it low, pro is it unspecified? No, it's circular. This is a specification. 
This is, you know, this is a low probability specified phenomenon, so obviously it's a result of design. And of course, as European peasants of the year 800, we know what causes fairy rings. <laughs> it's where the fairies had their parties. Now, of course, being as that it is now in the year, in the 21st century, um, we've known for quite a long time. I hope I'm not disappointing anyone, but that's not what causes fairy rings. If you go out to a fairy ring and you will look under the toadstools, you will not find any little teeny weeny beer cans at all. <laughs> fairy rings are caused by the way fungi reproduce. And fungi reproduce by sending out concentric mycelia, which are these underground little jobbies that under the right kinds of circumstances of moisture and temperature and light and heat and whatever, spring come up and of course because it's concentric it forms a circle. So we now have a natural explanation for fairy rings, right? We didn't in the year 800. So what we need in the explanatory filter here in his desi divine inference, <laughs> sorry, design inference, well that was right actually, we need another branch of unknown natural cause. But of course, if we do that, this completely destroys the design inference because you've got a fork at the top. There's a lot of other reasons that probability theorists and mathematicians and others have complained about the design inference, but basically no one has accepted it as being relevant at all to biology. And ascribing things like this, like design to biology, is really the crux of the problem. And one of the major problems that intelligent design has is that it makes an inappropriate analogy between the design of things like human artifacts, like machines, to biological structures, which may be very complicated and may even look somewhat like machines. Mount Rushmore is a favorite uh, example of design from the, in, uh, from the intelligent design proponents. They'll point out that faces do not appear upon mountains. That clearly if you are walking along and you see faces carved on a mountain, you know that an intelligence was involved here. Because this is not, you know, the forces of wind and erosion will not give you Jefferson's face on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Similarly, they see, when you see structural complexity in nature, when you see structural complexity in nature, we see complex molecular machines like the bacteria of flagellum or the vertebrate eye. We should conclude that they're like Mount Rushmore. They're made by an intelligent agent. Now, to the intelligent design proponent, molecular machines like the bacteria flagella are machines. They are not like machines. They are machines in the sense of assemblages. Um, Michael Behe calls this a purposeful arrangement of parts. Okay. And complexity is the key here. Something like the bacteria flagellum is god-awful complex. It's hard to study. It really has a lot of moving parts, quite literally. And it's pretty cool, and a lot of people are working on trying to understand how it works. Complexity is considered to be the big thing. It, when, B, when Dembski, by the way, <laughs> talks about probability, that is actually a synonym for complexity. But you know, a paperclip is designed. You look at a paperclip, you know this is not a natural object. You see a paperclip, you know this is designed. But not because it's complex. Paperclip isn't complex, but you know it's designed. There's something else going on here other than complexity if you're trying to understand what is something that is designed. If you look at the intelligent design literature, they talk a lot about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The, uh, the radio signals that they're trying, they, they screw it up something fierce. They, they really do not understand what SETI is all about at all. Um, they claim that the SETI astronomers are looking for complex signals. Remember the, the movie um, Contact, thank you. Love an audience that's actually listening. Um, in the movie Contact, uh, they got the signals that came in that were um, uh, prime numbers. That's a pretty complex signal. And so they knew that there was some intelligence. This was not just random noise. That's not what the SETI people are doing. What the, and this is the key to understanding why the intelligent people are wrong. The intelligent design people are wrong. <laughs> the SETI investigators 
are not looking for complexity. They are looking for artificiality. They are looking for signals that are not natural. Okay? They're not, it's not complexity that makes something not natural. It's things like form and function and structure and a whole lot of other things. Archaeologists are another um, um, analogy that the intelligent design people, they say, well, the archaeologists are out there. They find a chipped stone like this, and they look at the complexity, and they say, aha, this is not produced by just the random knocking together of rocks. This is made by an intelligent being. And of course, in this case, it's human beings, of course. This is made by an intelligent be being. Uh, it's, it's complex, therefore, it's, a, it's an example of design. Well, actually, when archaeologists are looking for human artifacts, they're not looking for complexity. They're looking for artificiality. They're looking for artifacts that, were, that are different from what you find naturally. A chipped stone like this is different from what you would find naturally because a human being made it for a purpose, and we understand what that purpose is. A human being made it out of a <clears throat> substance that we are familiar with. We know what chert and we know what kinds of, of stone um, fracture in this fashion. You don't do this with conglomerate. Okay? I mean, it, we, you know, we know that human beings choose certain um, materials to make stone tools out of. They make them for a purpose. We understand the purpose. We understand a lot about artif uh, archaeological artifacts. We recognize these artifacts based on a variety of things, taken together or taken separately. But particularly because it's an assemblage. It's the material it's made of, the shape or form it takes, uh, etc. And indeed, artifacts like machines are composed of parts that are assembled. They truly are what the ideas call a purposeful arrangement of parts. But the ID proponents present structures like the bacteria flagellum as if they were a purposeful arrangement of parts and even draw them like little machines. But biological structures are not like machines, not like an exploded diagram of pieces that you assemble all at one time. Biological structures are add parts, if you will, through a very different process of development and growth. Very, very different from the assemblage of artifacts by human beings. Yet the artifactual analysis, analogy is pervasive in the argument for design and saturates the claims of the intelligent design proponents. And it simply is wrong when it's applied to biology because biological structures are not a purposeful arrangement of parts that are all assembled at one time. They grow, they develop, they are natural, they are organic. They're very different from machines. I want to make another point about problems with intelligent design, and this is a logical problem. Now, one logical problem of intelligent design is that it makes a, another false dichotomy between natural cause, which are, of course, the normal laws of nature, matter, energy, their interactions, and so forth, and intelligent cause. And intelligent cause, obviously, it could be God, right? Uh, but there also are material agents that, are, uh, that produce intelligent, um, um, intelligently designed things. things. Human beings produce intelligently designed structures and so forth. So material agents or transcend transcendent agents are both example of intelligent cause. And this is contrasted with natural cause. The idea, of course, is that if you can prove that natural cause cannot do it, then you are left with intelligent cause, right? If creationism excuse me, if evolution is wrong, then creationism is right. It's the old creation science dichotomy. But they got it wrong here because these material agents belong over here on the natural side, right? Because things like humans, higher primates, um, extraterrestrials, if there are such things, are natural agents. They are made of carbon. Uh, they can be studied. Their, um, their motives, their procedures, their materials, their motivations, all of these can be studied with material agents. You can't do any of that with transcendent agents. We have no idea what God had in mind when he you know, put a perfectly respectable quadrupedal primate up on two legs and thus generated things like back pains and knee problems and uh, the other things that we have. The point being here is that 
their false dichotomy between natural cause and intelligent cause really results in only God being the intelligent cause. So we should really refer to this properly as what it is, which is transcendent cause. Um, I'm going to um, zip through and just not talk about a couple of things here because I am getting a little behind and you have been enormously um, polite. I do have to talk about Darwinism though actually, if you don't mind. I am not a Darwinist. I don't know what Darwinism is. Intelligent design literature is, is chock full of references to Darwinists. And you can sort of see the lip curling over the teeth there. Darwinists, th th this is an epithet. Dogmatic Darwinists and Darwinism. Um, I have no idea, as an evolutionary biologist, I have no idea what that means. Are they talking about what Darwin was writing about in the 19th century? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Are they talking about modern synthetic theory of evolution? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Are they talking about the post-synthetic theory of evolution, which is where we are now, with all the molecular and evo devo and all the other huge number of alternate or er, supplementary mechanisms to natural selection that we understand? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. What they are talking about when they say Darwinism, they are talking about their particular mindset of an ism, an ideology, okay? And ideologies, of course, are bad. Ide ideologies should have no part of science. And isms are ideologies. So Darwinism is an ideology to these people. And a Darwinist is a practitioner of Darwinism in a way that a botanist is not a practitioner of botanism, okay? <laughs> so they use the term Darwinism as a way of, it's a wonderful rhetorical um, uh, ploy of getting in the listener's mind the idea that, that there's an ideology associated with evolution. Oh yes, the ideology is atheism, another ism. So it's a way of putting in the audience's mind the idea that, that you know, Darwinism, evolutionary biology, is not really science. It is merely an ideology to promote evolution, uh, to, promote, to promote atheism. But, what they argue, again, this is the old creationist dichotomy, if you just eliminate Darwinism, by which they mean something to do with natural selection, but they also toss in all this other stuff, you therefore prove intelligent cause. But I just want to remind you, those of you who are not evolutionary biologists, that there are quite a variety of evolutionary mechanisms and processes in addition to natural selection, including some that we might not even have discovered yet. Right? So it's a little bit preliminary to say that if natural selection doesn't work, evolution can be chucked off the, the stage. Let's compare evolution, creation, science, and intelligent design. The historical narrative of evolution is living things had common ancestors. The pattern of evolution is the branching tree of life, the process is natural selection, other mechanisms, and so forth. Creation science also has a historical na narrative. It's the lawn, special creation of the kinds. The pattern is variation within the kinds, and the process is microevolution, but also God intervenes to specially create. Intelligent design is not nearly as scientific as creation science, because it has no historical narrative. Intelligent design avoids making any statements whatsoever about what happened. You can't get these people to say, did bears and dogs have common ancestors? Um, did the um, invertebrates of the Cambrian give rise to modern day invertebrates? You can't get them to agree with that at all. What they will argue is that evolution doesn't work, therefore God did it. They have no pattern because of course they refuse to have a, a um, historical narrative and they will not even tell you what the process or the, the way, how did, what did God do and when did he do it. That doesn't come into intelligent design either. We can infer from what they're saying that this is an intervening God who every time you see an irreducibly complex structure or one with complex specified information, God has intervened to create this specially. Now I want to talk about the cultural renewal aspect of intelligent design because this is where it gets really serious. The major uh, think tank of intelligent design is the Center for Renewal of Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. The Center for Renewal of Science and Culture um, is a center within the bigger umbrella of the Discovery Institute, but we tend to refer to it as the Discovery Institute because Center for Renewal of Science and Culture takes too long to say. <coughs> Excuse me. If you look at the evolution of the website Masthead, the first um, 
presentation was this Michelangelo's creation. And it certainly looks pretty religious. So they decided that, well, we really have to not do that. So they <laughs> changed. And the second iteration was um, Michelangelo's creation. But instead of Adam, you have a little DNA molecule. I showed this once at a theology conference. And the theologian said, you know, that makes God really, really, really little. <laughs> <laughs> In more ways than one, actually. Um, then they decided that they better chuck Michelangelo and uh, just go directly to um, one of the Hubble galaxies, uh, because that's real sciency. And, and, but of course, if you know any astronomy, and I didn't until an astronomer pointed this out to me, this particular um, Hubble galaxy uh, photograph is called the Eye of God. So they're, you know, they're just not getting it. Um, uh, then. They decided to drop the term renewal, and they became the Center for Science and Culture. And that was, that was also to make them sound less religious, because you know, AAAS is not the American Association for the Renewal of Science. Um, generally speaking, scientific societies aren't renewing anything. And so this was kind of a theological statement. So they thought they would sound more sciencey if they got rid of it. A friend of mine thought that maybe one of the other Hubble galaxies would be more appropriate. Um, and <laughs> I, um, but, but they haven't taken us up on that as a suggestion. But, you know, that, that, that is a, that, that's a real galaxy. I mean, that is really one of the Hubble galaxies. Just about a year ago, uh, I know you want to see it again. But, um, <laughs> Just about a year ago, I gave a talk at the American Astronomy Association meeting. I had a wonderful time. They were just great. And of course, I showed this slide, and they all just collapsed. I mean, they, they laughed for five minutes. I mean, they were just on the floor. They thought that was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. Um, astronomers, what do you expect? Um, and after the talk, uh, this guy came down, and he said, I just wanted to tell you, I took that picture. <laughs> he, said, he said, and I've never seen it used to better effect. <laughs> I like that a lot. OK, let's get serious here. Because the Center for Renewal of Science and Culture is a serious organization. Stephen Meyer is the director. Bruce Chapman is the director of the Discovery Institute and TOTO. When the Discovery Institute opened the doors of the Center for Renewal of Science and Culture, Bruce Chapman wrote this in the Discovery Institute Journal. For o Did you all notice that I didn't show you a PowerPoint slide with this big, long paragraph? Aren't you glad? <laughs> For over a century, Western science has been influenced by the idea that God is either dead or irrelevant. Two foundations recently awarded Discovery Institute nearly a million dollars in grants. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'm a nonprofit manager. Just you know, let me gather my thoughts here. Okay. Granted over a million dollars in grants to examine and confront this materialistic bias in science, law, and the humanities. The grants will be used to establish the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture, which will award research fellowships to scholars, hold conferences, and disseminate research findings among opinion makers and the general public. The more you read about the program, and there will, be about, there will be about six books to read from the center in the next four years, the more you will realize the radical assault it makes on the tired and depressing materialist culture and politics of our times, as well as the science behind them. Then when you start to ponder what science and politics might become under a sounder scientific dispensation, you will become truly inspired. Dispensation is another interesting term, if you know any uh, theological terms. Accordingly, our Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture seeks to show that science supports the concept of design and meaning in the universe, and that design points to a knowable moral order. This is not your average scientific society, folks. In the Wedge document, the goals of the Center for Science and Culture were to defeat scientific materialism and its destructive moral, cultural, and political legacies, to replace materialistic explanations with a theistic understanding that nature and human beings are created by God. 
This was from their website. That's where I got it. It also showed up in a very interesting document called the Wedge Document, which was a fundraising um, uh, document that the Discovery Institute prepared for an unknown funder. It was leaked. It showed up on the web. And it re it's their five-year plan. They wrote, Design theory promises to reverse the stifling dominance of the materialist worldview and to replace it with a science consonant with Christian and theistic convictions. This is not a mere scientific movement. It is a movement to promote a specific sectarian Christian theology. Philip Johnson makes this very clear that fighting philosophical materialism is the goal of the movement. I have built an intellectual movement in the universities and churches that we call the Wedge, which is devoted to scholarship and writing that furthers this program of questioning the materialistic basis of science. But science has a methodological basis, not a philosophical basis of materialism. But that's not what these folks believe. In Johnson's book, The Wedge of Truth, he talks about how evolution can be used as a wedge issue. If you can attack evolution, if you can make people believe that evolution is bad science, that scientists have been lying to you about evolution, that evolution is shaky stuff, then you can attack the materialist basis of science itself. In other words, we can break open science. We can wedge science op open, like a splitting ball in a wedge. We can wedge open science to allow in God as an explanatory agent if we can destroy evolution. And once we destroy the, the materialist methodological materialist basis of science, then we can destroy the philosophical materialism of society. This is what the wedge strategy is all about, and this is what intelligent design is all about. Now, this movement is quite active. There are lots and lots of books and videotapes and other materials. Uh, they just sort of keep going and going and going. Um, they have been very active in their publishing but also in trying to get intelligent design into state science education standards. There are a number of books that critique intelligent design, not as many as that are for um, Forrest and Gross, uh, Creationism's Trojan Horse on the Wedge Strategy, Young and Edis, Why Intelligent Design Fails, um, Robert Pennock's Intelligent Design Creation and Its Critics, and his earlier book, um, Tower of Babel, God, the Devil, and Darwin by Nell Shanks, a very, very good book, which unfortunately does not project very well, The Creation Evolution, excuse me, The Counter-Creationism Handbook by Mark Isaac, a very good book, Finding Darwin's God by Ken Miller, Defending Evolution for Teachers by Brian and Sandra Alters, and my book, Evolution and Creationism. <laughs> a most wonderful thing happened on Sunday. I have to share this with you. On Sunday, Evolution versus Creationism was actually reviewed in the New York Times book review section. I mean, this is so incredibly huge. Now, just among us friends, I didn't like the overall article, but she said such nice things about my book. I'm not going to criticize it, OK? So, you know, the New York Times book review is the sun, it's just it's this huge, I'm, I'm about to have um, I, I, I'm about to, who's, who's that actor? Um, um, Tom, I'm about to have a Tom Cruise moment here and just jump up and down. <laughs> no. But of course, everything, every author who gets his or her book reviewed in the New York Times goes to Amazon, right? Sunday night, my book reached 284 on the Amazon bestseller list. <laughs> Of course, you have to know that this is totally meaningless, OK? <laughs> if your book stays under 1,000 for two weeks, you've sold a lot of books. This is Sunday night. Only geeks buy books Sunday night, right? <laughs> and so geeks are buying my book. But I know geeks buy my book. So, but, but it's still, I made a slide, obviously, because this is just so incredibly exciting. In addition to all of the books by scientists critique and intelligent design, I do want to call your attention to the fact that there are a number of books in theology which also don't like intelligent design. Many of them by Jack Haught, who was one of the um, witnesses for the good guys in Kitzmiller versus Dover, God After Darwin is um, one of his books. He's written quite a few. Finding Gar Darwin's God by um, 
uh, Ken Miller. Perspectives on an Evolving Creation is a very important book by Keith Miller, who is a geologist at Kansas State. This is a book primarily by evangelicals accepting evolution. And the idea that evangelical Christians accept evolution, there's a bunch of them out there, they're trying very, very hard to convince their fellow evangelicals that you can be a faithful and conservative Christian and still accept evolution, I say thank you. This is a very good book if you have a conservative Christian friend who is concerned about evolution. Um, Peters and Hewlett is also a very good book that I would recommend, another book by Jack Hott. Good place where you can find lots of information about intelligent design is talkorigins.org and pandasthumb.org. I would recommend both of these. And of course, I would recommend the NCSE website, which is ncseweb.org. If you go there, you'll see this lovely bright blue page, because blue is my favorite color. You go to the newsroom, you get all the really depressing stuff. You can sort by year. So if you want to know what happened in 2003, you can pull out stuff. If you want to select for state of interest, you can go and pull down Michigan and find out what happened in Michigan. You can go to resources and find all sorts of stuff about creation and intelligent design. And it's full of lots of good information. I would encourage you to learn more about it. We just opened a new part of our website. If you uh, go to the web and you go to the um, upper right hand teaser box there, Evolution, Education, and the Law has got the transcripts and the witness statements and all the briefs and uh, decisions in the Kitzmiller trial, plus the Selman trial and other materials. I want to thank my staff, Eric Mickle, Wesley Ellsbury, Susan Spath, Nick Motzke, who lived out of a suitcase for six weeks in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania during the trial, and Glenn Branch, my deputy director, who make me look good and who do a whole lot of very important work, I think, in helping people to understand the creation and evolution controversy and maybe some things we can do about it. And I'm very impressed at how you put up with this very long talk so patiently. Thank you so much for coming to me. The question had to do with a case that came up a couple weeks ago in El Tajon, California, near Bakersfield, where a teacher was teaching an intercession class, a four-week intercession class, on philosophy of intelligent design. The idea being that, well, Kitzmiller versus Dover says you can't teach evolution as science. Let's just teach it, excuse me, you can't teach intelligent design as science. Therefore, we'll teach it in a philosophy class. Well, what the court said is that you cannot, what the First Amendment says is you cannot advocate, promote a religious position in the public schools. You cannot advocate intelligent design in science class. You can't advocate it in a philosophy class. She was advocating intelligent design. This was the two model approach. She was contrasting intelligent design as a valid scientific uh, theory with evolution as an invalid scientific theory and letting the students decide and just calling it philosophy. What was even funnier is that she didn't even know what intelligent design was. She used the title, and she was basically using materials from Answers in Genesis. She was using creation science stuff. It's just, um, you can find material on this on our website as well. The second part of his question was, um, should Mike Behe and I get together and design a class? Mike wouldn't go for that, because Mike believes that intelligent design is a valid scientific alternative to evolution, and he and the other intelligent design proponents want it in science class. I am perfectly happy with intelligent design and any other religious view being taught comparatively. In fact, I'd like that. I'm an anthropologist. I think comparative religion is great. It's fascinating. It's wonderful. I have often said that the American population is scientifically illiterate and theologically illiterate as well. We need more understanding of religion, its place in human culture, society. Comparative religion would be a great topic. And origin stories should be part of that. The intelligent design people aren't going to go for that, because they believe they have a true, a true science. My feeling is, if intelligent design is a real science, prove it. The burden of proof is on them. Come to the conferences. Make, give presentations, have posters, make your argument to the biochemists and the cell biologists and the paleontologists. Don't make it in the op-ed in the local newspaper. No, make it to the scientists. And if, 
if intelligent design is a better way of understanding nature, hey, we'll, ju we'll, get it. we'll jump on that bandwagon. Science is very competitive. If you've got a better way of understanding nature, you know, you got a train coming right away. They have to make that case. If they do, then they'll trickle down to high school. They haven't done that yet. The question was, should scientists become more involved in this issue, for example, in a local level and a state level? Yeah. <laughs> Um, the history of NCSC actually um, re exactly reflects that. NCSC got started in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, when all of these equal time for creation science bills were being brought into the state legislatures around the country. And scientists and teachers uh, banded together in communities and in states to go up and testify against those bills and try to keep them from getting passed. And uh, a network of people doing this uh, evolved from the grassroots, and it was clear that an organization to kind of coordinate these groups would be very helpful. For one reason is that once the Nebraska bill didn't get out of committee, the Nebraska scientists went home, and they went back to their day jobs, and you know we'd never heard from them again. So that's how NCSC got organized. This, this was to be the coordinating group for these local grassroots uh, groups that actually did the work. And that's the model we still follow. We support local groups like the Dover parents or um, like the parents in El Tejon who sued uh, the district to stop the course. We give them the information in science and religion and law and the other areas so that they can carry the fight. And scientists are a very important part of that coalition. We do put together coalitions because this is not just a scientific issue. You'll notice in my talk today I didn't talk just about science. Science is necessary but it's not sufficient to solve this problem. We have to have good science. We have to be able, as scientists, to stand up and say, no, this is science. This is not science. This is what we should be teaching. This is what we should not be teaching. But then we need to have a clergyman get up and say, I'm with him. Okay? We need a teacher to come up and say, I'm with them. And we believe, as teachers, as high school teachers, that we should teach standard science. And the scientists tell us to teach this, and that's what we want to teach. We don't want to teach this fringe stuff. We need this coalition of teachers, scientists, clergy, civil libertarians, parents. It, it's, it, it takes a village. Um, because the scientists alone can't do it, but we can't do it without the scientists. Are these requests coming from teachers? Yes. OK, that's very significant. I take it you have a board of education in Ann Arbor. Yes. The board of education is um, supervises the supervisor, the supervisor supervises the administration. If you can't get the administration to do something, get the board to do it. And if you can't get the board to do it, elect a new board. Well, what would you say to them? You could say to them that um, we teachers believe, and you know, the more of you who, who stand up, are the better. You could say we teachers believe that this controversial issue is generating questions that we would like some help learning the best ways to respond. And we would like to have some in-service on this topic. We are next to one of the finest universities in the country. There are resources here both in the education school as well as in the science departments to help us do that. And I would uh, make that point to the board. Uh, make, you know, if you can document that you have approached the administration, the administration has not been responsive, that is more ammunition on your side. And um, of course, the first thing you want to do is work behind the scenes with the board. See if you can, because we work behind the scenes all the time. A whole lot of stuff you never read about in the newspaper. Um, and that's the way we like, we don't like lawsuits. We really don't. I was rubbing my hands at Gull Lake just because it's such a crazy case. But I'm, I, I don't want a lawsuit in Gull Lake. I don't want any more lawsuits. I want these things to be solved behind the scenes. So go talk to the, if you've got a school board member who's likely to support you, go to him or her first and try to work up some enthusiasm on the part of the school board. See if you can get it done without going to the newspapers, without having to go to a school board meeting and do a big public thing. Because you're more likely to get, in general, I don't know the specifics of your district, but in general, you're more likely to get progress along these lines if you do it behind the scenes. But I, I think that's outrageous that they are not responding to teachers like that. We don't have any good national surveys on teacher attitudes or knowledge or understanding or reluctance or enthusiasm for teaching evolution. We have some state surveys, and it's not encouraging. 
Uh, the NSTA, the National Science Teachers Association, had an an online poll, you know, which of course are not scientifically valid. And they said this is not scientifically valid. But basically, those who wrote in, um, whom I actually would imagine would have been the more motivated teachers in a sense, because they read the NSTA website, so these are the more professional ones. But I think if I remember correctly, and if anybody does remember, I'm happy to be corrected, about 20 or 30 percent of the teachers said that they had experienced some form of anti-evolutionism, either from a parent, from a student, or most chilling, from an administrator. And those are the really sad ones. The stories that I hear from teachers, and I, you know, I go to science teacher meetings, we usually exhibit at NABT, I give talks and regularly go to NSTA. And I hear from teachers all the time that, you know, I'm the only one in my school who teaches evolution because our principal doesn't want us to. The question was that he had heard in his peripheral vision, if you can hear in your vision, um, that there were some state science standards that were being tinkered with to allow in supernatural explanation. It's more subtle than that. Um, you probably had heard news reports about the Kansas state edu science standards which have historically been very contentious. The good guys won, the bad guys won in 99, the good guys, they, they voted, you know, the, voted the rascals out and the good guys restored the good science standards in 2000. Now they're up for renewal, up for um, 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 uh, revision. And the school board is now majority creation, you know, creation members. Um, what they have done is not write the standards on, in the science as a way of knowing part and you know, the philosophy of science section of the, of the standards. They didn't rewrite it to say, bring God in, because they, you know, <laughs> the lawyers would be all over them. What they did was very subtle. The way the standards had been written, written is pretty much the way I described science here. Science is a you know, way of explaining the natural world restricted to natural cause. They took out the natural cause part, okay? Smart. And then publicized it, of course, so that any creationist teacher says, I don't have to restrict my teaching to natural cause now. It's very clever. Um, it's not saying teach creationism, but it's opening the door for it. So the idea is that this may be a legally more viable strategy than some of the other possibilities. So yeah, watch, watch Kansas. It's going to be fun. Thank you so much. It was very nice to be here.